Soldier Hawk, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Seamus. Always a pleasure. So I think it's been long enough that we have some games to talk about, although, you know, I've been waiting for you to finish Human Revolution because I really wanted to talk about that, and I notice you're, you're, still, you're still slowly working through that one. I am, but mental note, I will give you a call as soon as that is done. Yay! I've actually made my way through more of it um, than I have there, but uh, I've had some um, editing software issues after switching to Windows 10, because Windows 10. What, what, what do you use to edit? Um, so this is horrifyingly embarrassing, but I oh, use... No. Um, Windows Movie Maker, but not regular Windows Movie Maker. I use Windows Movie Maker 6.0 from back in the XP days. Um, huh. Well, I can't give you any advice. If you're doing that, then I can't give you any advice. I was going to suggest DaVinci Resolve, which is like, you know, modern and totally free, but... You obviously have a very particular setup, so I don't I don't think my advice will be useful to you. I'm not sure it's a good setup, and I've actually never heard of that. DaVinci Resolve, huh? Yeah, it's modern. I mean, it, it, it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, like, the Adobe Premiere or whatever. You know, all the, all the ones the professionals use, but it's totally free. And uh, at, that's what at we the risk of video. derailing, can I ask you a question about it before we get into the games, or do you sure. want me to do that later? No, no, sure. Okay. okay, so the big reason I still use what I use, despite just familiarity, is it's got a really particular way that it lets you interact with both the visual and the audio timeline that I find really intuitive, and I haven't been able to find something that replicates that. Like, just being able to, you know, shove the audio around wherever you need to to sync it up with the video really easily. It, it always seems like such a production in all the other so editing software I've used, which is why I've never made the switch. Well, I know you can do that, but I don't know how easy it is compared to XP Days Movie Maker. So I will leave it to you. I've only used it once. Uh, edit, uh, Isaac is my editor. So I'm I'm now out of my area of expertise. So I, I offered my advice and we can move on. I'm going to download it and give it a shot, especially if it's free. Cool. So I think the, the big thing that we're both eager to talk about is East Shade. Oh, yes. Um, have you finished the game? Oh, yeah. I've played it through several times, actually. Wow. Okay. I am not through the full game. I am... I, I'm still trying to get into Nava. So I've made it to the second island area and oh. pretty much walked all around it. But I don't okay, know... Okay, so you're about of a... I don't know, third of the way through the game, maybe? Cool. Uh, my and for those who haven't played this game, it's a it's a game where you get shipwrecked on an island, and you're a painter. So you go around and you paint things, and you do quests for people, which usually involves which usually involves painting a picture for them, either of something or from a particular location. And that's my understanding of the game so far. Yep, that's honestly, there's not a whole lot more to the game. I mean, you get many more tools for exploration, things that make things easier. Of course, uh, other areas will open up for you, but that is the that is 100% the core gameplay loop of the game. All right, so uh, I want to let you go first. So, like, can you tell me what you think of East Shade? So, East Shade is low-key one of my favorite games. Like, it's not exciting, it's not mind-blowing, but it's calm and it's beautiful. In, in a lot of the ways, it's honestly just 
beautiful screenshot generator the game um right. filled with a bunch of really cute and mostly nice anthropomorphic characters who send you out to find beautiful things take screenshots of them because you're a painter but there are no actual painting mechanics it's really just an excuse to make you look at what you're doing and really take in the the scenery or the object and find just the right way to frame it um and i i think it's one of the most wonderful just relaxing chill out games that I've ever, ever found. I love just getting lost in that world. I, um, for context, my wife is a painter. She's a watercolor painter. And when she found out about this game, she came in and, like, I was talking about it and doing the show this week. And when she heard about the game, she gave me this look like, why did you not tell me this game exists? <laughs> How could you do this to me? <laughs> um, but she can't play it herself because um, she gets motion sick anytime in any first person game. So she is having me play through and I do all the driving. But this is kind of like we used to do that with adventure games back in the day. So she she's enjoying it more than I am, even though she's not really playing it. Oh, that's that's awesome. So, I I have to ask. I I was super wondering how an actual. Uh, I every time I play, I wonder how an actual artist would look at it because, the thing about the game is, it, kind of like I've already said, like the hook is that you're an artist and you paint, but there's no actual painting mechanic. I mean, the paintings just right. kind of magically appear when you click the button. So it's clear that it's not supposed to be like an artist simulator. It's more, I guess it's more making you look at the world as an artist would than actually replicating the act of creating art, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, she did not have any comments on that. I thought it was, I was expecting something out of her, you know, to the... I was expecting, like, some kind of eye roll. Like, you know, it's not that easy as just taking a screenshot. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, but <clears throat> no, she's fine with it. She likes it. Um, on the point of the graphics, yes, this game is absolutely one of the most beautiful games I've played this year. Um, when I fired it up, I was a little disappointed. I was like, oh... There's a lot of really ugly, low-poly objects in here, and the popping is terrible. And I played it like that for like two days. And then I was like, I should check and make sure. And I opened up the video settings, and it was set to lowest, lowest possible. Oh, and I dear. was like, I really should have, I really should have checked that before I recorded all this footage and took all these screenshots. <laughs> And just, you know, spent the time. Like, I felt like I'd been kind of um, tricked by the trailer. I'm like, this is not as good as it looks in the trailer. <laughs> but for some reason, it didn't occur to me to check the settings and make sure I had the graphics turned up. Like, how stupid is that? But I guess oh, I'm just man. spoiled. I'm just spoiled by modern games just figuring out, like, what it should be and just automatically adjusting that it didn't occur to me to check or become spoiled. Also, you said the characters were cute. I, my wife, my wife thinks so too, but I find them all creepy and off-putting, like everybody, especially the deer-faced people. Yeah, I, I can totally see having a completely, like, Uncanny Valley reaction to it. I, I totally, I, I can totally see that at the same time that my own personal reaction is, oh my gosh, that's so sweet. But I think that's because when I see the Uncanny Valley deer person on my screen, my head knows what they're going for. 
and my head just overrides what my eyes are seeing and replaces it in what in my heart with oh i know exactly what they're going for and i'm so here right. for that even if it didn't come out perfectly on the screen the other thing i find really hilarious is like at one point there's the there's some flowers you're not there's signs saying hey don't pick these flowers <laughs> oh you didn't and you didn't pick no the i thistle. couldn't even I, I was gonna try, but I couldn't find the thing to pick. Like where where is it? Where I want I wanna I wanna break the rule of this sign. Where is this thing I'm not supposed to do? I'm gonna click on it, but I couldn't find it. Um but somebody yeah, tells you later they are there. Somebody tells you later the owls use that to do you know, it's part of their Part of the ecology of the area, the uh, local owl population depends on that. And my first thought is, wait, are you talking about, like, the bird owls or the people owls? This is confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Always like a are... problem when things are anthropomorphic. Right. Right. Like, it does. It has regular bird owls, and then it has people with owl heads. And it's, I, I feel like, I feel like that distinction really needed to be made for me. Because if it's for the regular <laughs> owls, I don't care. But if it's for the people owls, then I should do their quests before I steal their, their plants. Yep. Yep. Um, and I, I won't spoil, I won't spoil anything. Um, but there are, are quests involving that plant later. So you will you will get to talk to owl people and learn more about that plant and make some moral choices later on in the game. Choices matter. Choices matter, capital C, capital M. Oh, so it is a sweet game and really ridiculously good looking. Like not just graphically, but like you could tell the the art team was really stacked with just I don't know how many people made this game, but the people that made the environment absolutely knew what they were doing. Like, there are AAA games that struggle to hit this level of just detail, where it doesn't feel like somebody just spammed grass all over the place and then threw down rows of trees. Like, too, too many AAA games feel like that. Like, every little side of every hill feels a little different. This one is this kind of grass and these trees, and then there's a bare spot, and then there's some rocks, and... and it just feels like it's constantly changing as you walk around. It doesn't ever... You don't ever look around and go, yeah, more of this crap. No, no, never. And and even as you open up other areas and continue to explore, I, I never once had that, had that reaction. And the environments are varied enough once you get all of your you know, ability to move around the map and open up other areas. The environments are varied enough that even if you do get sick of looking at windmills on Tiffmore Bluffs, you can go, oh, well, I'll just go check out this, the ice cave over there, you know? Right, right. It's such a it's such an unusual game. It's like, it's such an unusual game. It sounds like a disaster on paper like this would never work there is no really way that this game should work it it 100 percent right. should not be a game that's even remotely fun or playable right it sounds super boring it's like an adventure game except the solution to all the puzzles is make a painting yeah or or you know exactly where to go with it. it's definitely not a a mystery game. There were a few, like, low-key, gentle mysteries to solve that that you'll you'll bump into some of them in Nava, but um, right. There's the mirror puzzle. None of it in, is in the area with the pink trees, and that was like, oh, this is the most adventure gamey it's felt. Right, right, and um, like I said, there's some mysteries that revolve around you know lore where you'll see things and you'll go huh I wonder if that's something and it turns out to be you know a 
couple of subquests revolving around stuff and it tells you more about the world, but it's all super gentle and 99% of everything in the game is super just kind. Which, yeah. After so many years of playing like Grand Theft Auto V was right. just like the most beautiful palette cleanser of all time. I'm just like, really, this is the mean quest? And all I have to do is feed your brother great pastries that he doesn't like? Okay. Right. Oh my god, I haven't finished that one yet. Uh, but I ran into that one and I was like, oh, here's the edgy part of the game. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> a mild prank. A prank that wouldn't even be edgy enough for like TikTok. You know, it's like it's <laughs> Absolutely. Just... No, and uh it, there there are a couple other quests where if you go the I mean, there's not really a bad guy route, but I mean the like I said, the game is so gentle it's pretty pretty obvious when you're asked, you know, to do something that's probably probably not the morally best thing to do and I've, I've actually never taken those options in this game. But I'm sure, you know, you aren't particularly punished. You might get scolded by some characters or something. But, you know, nothing serious. I think I can be I think I can handle being yelled at by somebody that has a deer face. <laughs> Exactly. I think there is, um, if you make a certain choice, there's probably one small area of the game you can get yourself locked out of. But, um, I mean, you would know that you're doing it. I think the only catch might be that I don't know, I don't remember how it shows up in game. Uh, I know it, it basically. Without spoiling anything, you get asked by someone to destroy something and, you know, the quests turn in person and you might go, oh, okay, I'll go do that, not realizing that there's an alternative to that. But that's uh, about as tricky as the game gets. Is it doesn't point out all your options. Like, that's, it's be yeah. that's it being clever. Yeah, I'm not sure that one. I'm not sure that one does. It actually might, though. Like, it might show up in the journal where, you know, if you read it, it says, it might say, or you can do this. But I honestly, I don't remember if it does or not. Still, such a, I mean, I would recommend this game just to run around and look at crap. It's so good. Oh, yes. It's just so pretty. I'm, I'm wondering if... Too. the it is. It's not expensive at all. I'm wondering if one of the reasons they were able to make it so pretty is just that there aren't very many systems in the game. Like, there's a very simple right. quest system, but there's no combat. There's basically dialogue and the graphics engine. And that's pretty much the game. That's the game. Yeah, that and painting, I, I, I guess. Which is yeah, just basically yeah, yeah. a really... Which is basically a screenshot feature. Right. This is a screenshot with a filter. Right. And the filter isn't even that much of a filter. It isn't like, oh, that's super stylized. You know, it's just right. like a little bit fuzzy compared to the thing being rendered in front of you. Absolutely. It's still oh so man, I, I so look forward to to you getting into the city and having the world open up a bit. I cannot wait to hear about that. I I I am curious what you think of the voices, the voice work. It's unusual to have this much voice work in a in an indie game, which clearly an indie game that you know everybody that talks to you is voiced fully. Yes, they absolutely are. You know, um, what's funny is I had the same question to you on the tip of my tongue. Um, I mean, I think there... I certainly don't mind it. It definitely fits the kind of almost... Um, 
I, I'm not even sure what to call it. Like the, it, it's not a cartoony game, but the aesthetics of the characters are definitely cartoony because you've got you know walking bears and owl people and stuff. Um, and I think the voices definitely fit that. They're uh, sometimes they're a little over the top, but I it never in such a way that I found I felt like you know, torn out of it and thought like, oh, that's really, that's a really terrible line reading, which is usually the kiss of death right. of voice acting for me. Um, right. So it didn't really bother me overall. I mean, it's, it's probably not for everyone. And again, I was probably kind of doing that thing where I, where my heart was going, I totally get what you're going for, so I will excuse the fact that it's not perfect, and I will just go with it because I want to go on this ride. Right, right. The individual performances are fine. They're obviously not professionals, but they're amateurs doing a really good job. Like you said, there aren't any really bad line readings. Like, like so many indie games, you have somebody reading the line and they don't understand the context, so they're reading it and or they just they're not an actor, and so they read it in completely the wrong tone. And you don't get that in this game. Everybody seems to like understand what their character is supposed to be doing and feeling. The thing that drives me bonkers is that every single inhabitant of the island has a different accent, and I can't get over it. Oh, yeah, they kind of do. I think they were going for um, trying to have the different races have a, have a semi-consistent accent, but that didn't super work out. No, no, it's, yeah, you, like, even in the first town, it's like, there's American accent, posh British, British accent, sort of the lower class British accent that drops the H's, um, I think there's an Irish accent, and, and, and a Russian accent, and that's just in the first little village that you sort of walk through on on your way to the rest of the game and it's just so random and even the voices themselves don't like they put somebody with a really high and smooth voice and gave it to a bear and I'm like why would you give that voice to the bear can that guy play literally anything else <laughs> like, the, like this monkey character, he's got a nice deep kind of gruff voice and he reads like this and I'm like, that voice could work as a bear. Why don't you have those two trade? But whatever. It's pretty good. I wonder how they, I wonder how they farmed that out. You know, being an indie, that's not easy to do. No, no. And you can definitely tell that, you know, people, um, you can tell when the same person plays different roles, like not... Not in a particularly bad or distracting way, but um, so it's not like they got, you know, a new person for every single character, because that would be right. absurd with all the voice work they have. But, um, yeah, I don't know how they did that either. I know that they, um, in the end credits, they definitely have, you know, a, a section for voice acting. And off the top of my head, I don't recall any names from elsewhere in the credits, so I suspect they actually got, you know, obviously they're they're not getting, um, you know, Tom Cruise or anyone like that, but people who are Tom. Who they, are this isn't Tom actors. Baker and Steve Blum, right? Jennifer right. Hale. <laughs> oh, I'm replaying Mass Effect again. I love oh, her performance well, so much. <laughs> what? I love Jennifer Hale's performance so much. Yes. Yeah, that's... She is really... I was just thinking about... I, I was just going through that a few weeks ago. I was like, I could go for another trip through Mass Effect 1. Oh, but then I'm going to want to keep playing, and then the hurting starts. Yeah. I, I'm about a third of the way through Mass Effect 2, and at least the characters and the character missions are really good. Yeah. Oh sure, yeah, you get to know the 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 characters in the in the second one and that's right. Especially you've got Morden and Legion and and how did we get talking about Mass Effect again? Oh my goodness. <laughs> because I it's need us. help. 
All right, well, let's swing to the opposite end of the spectrum from East Shade um, and talk about Red Dead Redemption 2. I've never played any of the Red Dead games. I mean, I'm aware that it's, you know, the Wild West. It's, it's a cowboy game and that the graphics are really, really good and the production values are even more extravagant than GTA V. But it's also made by Rockstar. And wow, I can only take so much Rockstar. It's just it's so much nihilism. It just brings me down. Yeah, it it definitely has a bit of that. Uh, well, more than a bit of that. Um, the good news, at least so far, um, and I'm not super, super far in it yet, um, you're definitely not playing a good person. I mean, you're, you're right. playing a bunch of, you know, a member of an outlaw gang and you, you know, rob trains and, you know, you have your little outlaw camp away from the, the people who are hunting you and, and that's kind of your vibe. But, um, it's, what it's not is it's definitely not GTA 5 where it's just gross and hateful and horrible which is not to say that there aren't terrible people and not to say that terrible things don't happen but it, at the risk of a very impertinent comparison it's like the difference between watching I didn't even know what I would compare GTA 5 to I don't know, some, you know, just horrifyingly nihilistic, gross-out kind of a movie versus, like, The Godfather, which is also right. gross and has horrible people and horrible things happen, but it makes a lot of sense and it's all for a really good reason and even when it brings you down, it's it makes sense in such a way that it's not like the world is shit. It's more like, wow, these people in this situation is really terrible and we're going to tell their story. You know what I mean? Right. Right, so you're not really far into Red Dead 2. I, I've been, like, on the fence because on one hand, I love... I love... Cutting edge rock stars, R rock stars cutting edge technology has always amazed me. But then their the the tone of their games has been very off putting and actually makes me feel feel bad. Like feel bad in a way that sticks with me when I walk away from the game. And so I've been on the fence about Red Dead Two for a long time. I I have the same reaction. Uh, I, I hesitate to recommend something that, because I know that feeling really well, and God knows, GTA V almost made me sick to my stomach, like, literally. <laughs> like, Same. not even kidding. Like, that was, wow. There's so much unnecessary unnecessariness in that game. Holy crap. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but... Like, the game's angry at you for buying it. Like, <laughs> yeah, for it, like, it. actively... Yeah. Th ugh, ugh, just bad. So, um, what it reminds me of is... Uh, the tone reminds me of Spec Ops The Line, actually, without the, yeah. the um, vitriol and anger at the player that Spec Ops has. This is that kind of a tone where you're just... You're watching a group of people just make terrible, terrible, sh life shattering decisions. But it's not, it's not at all feel bad in the same way that GTA 5 is. Like, uh, unless they turn the tone on a dime, which I, I don't think the game could have like been as popular as it did if they had pulled a tone shift like that right we would have heard about I, it by now exactly 
I think you're pretty... I think it's worth a shot for you. Especially if you like that kind of gameplay. And if you're into the cowboy aesthetic. Um, this is a... This is... I mean, I can already tell this story is 100% going to end in, in terrible, terrible tragedy. <laughs> right? Like, right? That's... But... <laughs> But I mean tragedy in like, in the real sense of the word, like in the Shakespearean sense of a tragedy, not the tragedy of I have to torture this poor guy for no reason. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? And yeah. So when you first came in here and were telling me about what you have been playing lately, you mentioned Beyond Blue, which I've never even heard of. And that's interesting. You started to describe me, describe it to me, and I thought of Subnautica. Is it anything like Subnautica? And if not, what is it like? Um, it's it's got a little bit of of Subnautica in it, um, except it's not. Uh, it doesn't take place on an alien world. It's it's strictly. It's almost an educational game, except it's 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 not. But um, it's all about learning about our actual oceans. Um, they say they were, um, you know, inspired by the Blue Planet series that uh, National Geographic did a while ago. Um, right. So it's, it's very much about exploring our oceans and you swim around and do things like, um, you know, you scan whales and then... When you go back to your submarine, you can look at the models and it'll tell you true facts about whales. And you unlock like interviews with actual oceanographers that you can listen to if you want. Um, and the only thing that makes it a little bit ungrounded from our current reality is they, they set it in the very near future so that you have an excuse to have a essentially a magic dive suit that lets you swim around at depths that would be absolutely impossible for a human to to survive you know we have to send ROVs down to look at you know the bo the bottom of the you know i can't remember the name of the place but the the trench that's like the lowest point in the ocean yeah. you know obviously you can't swim around out there but in this game because you want to be able to swim around and and look at that stuff. You have a magic suit, basically, that lets you do that. But that's the only nod to, like, sci-fi in the game. It's really about just getting to swim around a beautiful model of our oceans and learn about the creatures. And there's a... There's a... a definitely a, a plot, and you get to know a little bit about your main character and stuff. But it's it's mostly an excuse to just swim around. What is the gameplay? Like, is there combat? Is it just swim around and take pictures? Uh, it's not take pictures. Um, basically, you're you're actually playing a scientist on a on a dive team. Um, or you're the diver, and then you've got you know your surface team that will say, you know, hey, we think that there are some orcas out this way. Why don't you go? Um, you know, put your little go tag them so we can track them and then you'll swim out and you'll interact with the orcas and and tag them um and you've got i guess this is actually another nod to sci-fi you have a little um like drone that you can use to zoom in on the creatures and and study them um and that sort of thing so it's mostly following waypoints on your map while you swim around the ocean and and interact with the animals and clues that that your team tells you to interact with. Interesting. How did I not hear about this? And there's a free swim mode after you beat the game, too, which is kind of nice. Um, and it's another really cheap one. I think it was like 20 bucks. I think it might be... It might also be early access. I honestly can't remember if it is or not. Um, but if it is early access, I, it, I didn't find anything that was super bothersome or game-breaking. Just very, it, again, kind of like Ishade, a very nice chill-out game to just swim around and look at pretty fish kind of a thing. 
And I've always wanted to go swim down on the bottom of the ocean and check out whale falls and hydrothermal vents. And this game let me do that, which was pretty sweet. That's very cool. Can't believe I haven't heard of it. So you said it's educational. Would you say it's educational in the way that, say, Kerbal Space Program is educational? It's not be depicting realistic things, but it teaches you real things. I would say yes. I, th I am assuming that they're, I mean, I suppose they could be making up facts about whales and stuff, but that would kind of defeat the purpose of, like, that would defeat the whole, like, tone of the game if it wasn't right. real. So I, I would say, yeah, it definitely does, because you hear, even if you don't feel like reading the logs and listening to the, like, interviews with the oceanographers that you can unlock um you know your team does a bunch of chattering about various stuff and you'll have pop-ups explaining things to you so absolutely i mean you could learn at least as much from playing this game as you would from like a national geographic documentary about the same sort of thing very cool very cool all right um let's do some mailbag questions Excellent. Dear Seamus and Soldier Hawk, the recent release of Beyond a Steel Sky, a, tw a sequel 26 years in the making, I'll bet it wasn't 26 years in the making, I'll bet it was 25 years in the not doing anything, and then one year in finally <laughs> getting around to it. No, don't pop the poor guy's bubble, Seamus. No, 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 I just... <laughs> I'm just teasing. Yep. Anyway, it's got me wondering if either of you are partial to the adventure game. For me, the best thing about the genre is the characters. Over the years, I've really treasured getting to meet the likes of George Staubert, Nico Collard, Phoenix Wright, Maya Fey, and of course Guybrush Threepwood and Elaine Marley. So my two-part question is firstly to wonder whether you have any favorites that you'd like to discuss, and more broadly, how important you think good characters are to a game, and whether or not you think the industry is getting it right at the moment. Yours, Asta Asta. A-S-D-A-S-D. -A -A um, thank you for the question. So have you played um, Beneath the, what was it? Be Beneath the Steel Sky, I believe, is the original. Um, I, I have not, nor have I, I, I haven't played either of them. I tried play like it was years after Beneath the Steel Sky came out, and I tried to go back to it, and I forget what went wrong, but I didn't get more than ten or fifteen minutes into the game. I hit some sort of interface or technology problem, something with DOSBox, or, or maybe I couldn't get screenshot. I don't rem I don't remember. It was it was just some minor annoyance. And I set the game aside thinking, okay, I need to figure that out and I'll come back to it. And then I, you know, then it just fell off my playlist and I never got around to it. So I have not played Beneath a Steel Sky or Beyond a Steel Sky. I think it's fascinating that we're getting this sequel a quarter century later. People don't reference this game very often. Like you hear the you know, there's the big core titles that people think of when they talk about um, adventure games. You know, your King's Quest, Monkey Island, um, I guess Phoenix Wright qualifies. And, Quest for uh, Glory, which is my personal Quest, favorite. Quest for Glory and Long the Longest Journey series. Those are like the the big everybody's big go-to examples of the genre even though there are many men and uh i have no mouth and i must scream kind of makes that list um but i think it's amazing that a quarter century later we're getting this sequel it, and it makes me sad i didn't play really, the original it really is incredible that uh that it's being revived like that. Like like I said, I, I wasn't particularly aware of either. All I can say is I I really, really hope that the the fans of the original get something that they really love. Cause I I know that feeling at least of of having something you love um you know revived or come back 
coming back after a while or even just a, a sequel to something you love and i i hope for those guys that it's everything that they want yeah now um the the name the names that asta as the drops here it, they drop a few names on them. The first two are from Broke, the Broken Sword series, which I'm not familiar with. Then there's Phoenix Wright, and then he, and then we name Chuck, <laughs> name check, um, Guybrush and Elaine Marley from Monkey Island. And so the 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 first part of this question is: Do we have any favorite characters? And yeah, I guess Guybrush and Elaine would be my favorites too. Like, I just really, really like those two characters. Um, in the early games, uh, the, the Monkey Island games, the, the later adaptations, um, the creators did not get the deal with Elaine Marley, and they messed her up. But Ooh, I loved that's them. That's so terrible. Yeah, in the, for context, the first game, you're Guybrush Threepwood, and you want to be a mighty pirate. And you fall in love. It's just the most hilarious scene where the two of them finally meet and and um, sappy music plays. But they call each other horribly sappy. Oh, sugar boots. You know, just terrible, cringy nicknames <laughs> for each other. And it, it it was it had me crying. It had me laughing until I was crying when I played it. You know, in the mid '90s, it was such a good moment. Um, but the whole gag with Elaine Marley is that she's a real pilot. Like, in a normal story, she's the main character. She's the Indiana Jones. She's always got control of the situation. She kicks everybody's ass. But Guybrush is having his own side adventure, sort of trying to keep up with her. So throughout the game, you sort of realize that she didn't need your help, and that's part of the joke. Like, she rescued herself, and she had a plan, and she's four steps ahead of everybody. You know, you can imagine showing up, like, I'm going to help in an Indiana Jones story. And, of course, Indy's already knocked out all the guys and took the thing and run out the door and stole a plane. And he's flying off, and you're like, oh, well, now i got to get, like, and you're just this <laughs> hanger-on that chases them around. Oh, that's um, fantastic. And it's, it's great. And, it, you know, that's where the jokes are, is you trying to keep up with her. And in the sequels, like one of the sequels, you rescue her like three times in the same game. Like that's not, that's, that's not correct. You have done that character wrong. <laughs> like you don't rescue her. You don't try to rescue her three times and find out she's already rescued herself. You actually save her three times in the same game. And it's just like, oh, that's painful. That just goes against her character. So I, I would just like to point out that I, I've never played any of the Monkey Island games. Um, you just gave me basically a 30-second elevator pitch summary of their relationship. And I can already yeah. tell you how wrong it is that you rescued her three times in that game. Right. Right, and she she falls in love with Guybrush because he's not a he's the most unpiratey guy around, but he has this dream of being a mighty pirate, and he's such a milk toast blando nice guy, and it's just this great <laughs> dynamic where she is this, you know, she is this pirate swashbuckling badass, and he's this giant nerd. And it's just, she likes him because he's a nerd. And, oh, uh, man. Oh, it's a that sounds funny so Terry game. Pratchett. You know, now that you say that, I, I can see that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, she feels like Cohen the Barbarian in the story. Just, that's the joke, is that nothing's a problem for her. Nice. And, uh... So I was disappointed in the sequels, but yeah, that first game, those two characters really, really sold it. I highly recommend, even today, you can get remakes of the game. I, I love the original. It's just such a good adventure game. Um, it might be my favorite adventure game of all time. So, but to answer this question, do you have any favorite adventure game characters? 
I haven't played a whole lot of adventure games, especially not uh, modern ones, so I, I can't say I do. Um, I did just start, like I just started playing Disco Elysium, and I really like my, uh, my drunk detective who doesn't know what the hell he's doing, but I don't know that I know of well enough to call him a favorite character yet. Okay. To answer ASD ASD's question, uh, I would say, yeah, getting the characters right. And a lot of the early games focused so hard on puzzles, like your King's Quests and your and stuff. And I think that's why that brand of games kind of died off. They focused on the mechanics, not on the characters. And then when the mechanics went out of style. There's not much, like, I I loved King's Quest 3 back in the day, but I wouldn't play it now. I'm not nostalgic for that. Um, but I, I could, I'm always up for a playthrough of Monkey Island. <laughs> like, that's just so good. And then, yeah, it's all the characters. Okay, I'm definitely going to find Monkey Island and try this out, because that sounds phenomenal. There's a version out there, I swear. Am I imagining this? I... There's a version, a remake or whatever, where you can add a, the press of a button, switch between their modern remake graphics and the original, like, 256 color graphics. I'm not sure if that's actually the case or if I dreamed that. I'm not going to look it up now, but somebody will tell me in the comments because I, I remember that, but I, I don't know. Let's move on. Hi. So I finished Black Mesa earlier this year, and I've noticed one thing about it. There's a great expansion on the original ideas, and in some ways switched the, the closer to Unreal, to original Unreal instead of Half-Life. But one thing that stood up is that almost every challenge or puzzle was repeated three times in increasing difficulty. I don't mind usage of the rule of three, but its repeated usage started to seem very artificial. So I wonder if any of you noticed it, and what alternatives to the rule of three you th can think of. Best regards, Deadly Dark. Thank you, Deadly Dark. So I have not played all the way through Black Mesa. I, I got stalled at, like, the halfway point. Got distracted by, you know, something that came out, and I set it aside. Like, I have so many games. So I did not notice this. So did you notice this? You know, I racked my brain after reading this email um and i didn't go back and watch any of of the footage that i had but i could not for the life of me think of an example even though i know exactly what deadly dark is talking about uh, i certainly but when i think of the rule of three i always think of jrpgs <laughs> that's where it always i feel like <laughs> things always smack you over the head with that um and right, I cannot. I, 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 Go yeah, I think this rule of three is the um, introduction, reminder, and payoff that you get. Exactly. And this is the movie rule of three instead of the video game rule of three, which is, yeah, I mean, the JRPG rule of three and the Bioware rule of three. Like, three is the perfect number of people in your party. Four is too many to manage. And, you know, there's the the holy trinity of RPGs where you've got um, healing, tanking, and DPS. Like, three is just this perfect number for party composition. Yep, yep. Um, I, I was actually also thinking in terms of the setup reminder payoff too, though. I, I always think of, of the, like the Final Fantasy mid-battle tutorials where they'll tell you, hey, by the way, you can cast a spell. Did you know you can cast a spell? Because it really works on those enemies of the opposite elemental type. And so it'll take you through the tutorial of how you select a thing and select a thing and okay. Great, now I know how to use magic. Then the next battle, they'll go, Hey, by the way, don't forget you can cast that spell. So you cast the <laughs> spell without them micromanaging. Okay, now you open your magic menu. Scroll down to ice. Press the A button to cast your spell. 
Um, and then eventually you'll run up against a boss who has elemental weaknesses that you have to exploit. And every JRPG I've ever played has a tutorial reminder payoff that goes almost exactly like that. Not always regarding magic, that's just the example that came to mind, but um, that's always what I think of when I think of Rule of Three, and I couldn't, I can't pull out any examples from Black Mesa off the top of my head, although I'm sure they exist because that is really the a great way to teach someone something. Sure. Now, you can find plenty of examples of that particular rule of three in Half-Life 2, where it's like, okay, here's the weapon. You try and use it. Okay, that's how you use it. You know, you use it in safe circumstances. Then you use it um, in moderately dangerous circumstances. And then you use it in very challenging circumstances along with everything else. Like Ravenholm being okay. Here you play with the gravity gun in the in the scrapyard or whatever to get a feel for it to introduce it, and then you work your way through Ravenholm and the uses you have for it. It kind of blends two and three together, where it's like okay, the gravity gun is the best weapon to use here, and it just becomes more and more challenging how you use it as it goes along. Yep, really, the reminder in Ravenholm is, and this moment is burning in my brain because I hate Ravenholm and it scared the ever-loving bejesus out of me. Um, but the reminder in Ravenholm, I think, because like you said, this, the setup is in the scrapyard when you play ball with dog. Um, but then the reminder is when you go to Ravenholm and the very first thing you see after you get down the spooky hill... Um, the light is shining directly on a zombie that's been impaled against the wall with a buzzsaw. Yep. That you can immediately pull out with your gravity gun and it falls to the floor. And that's your reminder that, hey, you can use this, you know? Not only, not only that, but you have to pull that out of the wall to clear the way for yourself because it's in your way. Oh, when, that's right. I forgot and that. When you, and when you do that, it's scripted to immediately have a zombie come out of the door ahead of you, trying to get the player to just reflexively go, Bleh! and throw it at it, and cut it in half. And it's like, oh. <laughs> like, that is just Valve. That is just so oh, Valve. so this... brilliant. Right? <laughs> it's so brilliant. And I did that. I did exactly that. I follow... Like, you think you're making choices while you're playing the game, but you the whole thing it's like a disney park it's just everything is crafted so that you think you're exploring on your own and making choices but really you know the there's somebody behind the scenes pulling the strings and they know exactly where you're going to be looking at what time and when it's time to turn this light on and this light off and when it's time to say the thing it's so amazing the illusion of choice is an incredibly powerful thing and pr right. maybe even better than actual choice because I would rather be guided by a writer than just make shit up on my own. <laughs> right, right. I forget, what was this? Oh, the rule of three in Black Mesa. Yeah, I can't think of any mm -hmm. rule of three in Black Mesa. I'm not saying I'm it's sure not there. It I just, yeah, I'm sure it was, but I just can't think of it. Uh, all right, let's, we've got one question left. Let's wrap this up. Dear Diecasters, when I played East Shade last year, I felt like a good term to describe it would be unevenly developed. What one thing would you most like to have seen developed further, either in the game or in a hypothetical sequel? Or conversely, what underdeveloped thing should have been scrapped? This could be mechanical or story related. Um, and then, and cheers, Daniel Philadelphius Burke. And below, I'll, I'll put the entire email in the show notes for those that want to read it. But, he, but Daniel gives an example here of the, um, T that lets you see hidden objects. I didn't realize that's what it did. I thought it just gave you inspiration. So I've been hoarding my tea. Uh, 
um, different tea for a specific quest that you haven't seen yet. Oh, I see. Uh, I see. Um, and he says he'd love to see a game expand on the painting mechanics, which is my answer, too. Um, so, uh, go ahead, Soldier Hawk. What's, like, one thing you think should have been cut or developed more? So, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I definitely could have lived... Well, see, I say this, but then I also know why they put put it in there. Um, there are some uh, movement mechanics later in the game that just seem a bit, and and the point of them is to, to gate you from getting to certain areas before they want you to, but um, they're kind of goofy and don't really fit the tone of the world, I don't think, which to me is all about kind of being meditative and, and walking places and that kind of thing. Um, oh, okay. I just talked myself into an answer. Um, the thing I would have loved to see cut okay. is dealing with boats. The boat mechanics in this game are bad, and I don't like them. <laughs> I've lost more than one boat to oh, clipping I, or I have getting not... stuck on a rock. <laughs> I have not gotten to ride around in a boat yet. Did not know. I tried to. I found a fisherman by the river and I was like oh he's got a boat here can I use it and I you know click on it but no it's not interactive so I was like oh I guess boats aren't a thing in this game no they they are you'll start by uh you actually have probably already met the guy or missed the guy who teaches you how to make a raft for shallow water um although you won't actually be able to build the raft until you get in the city that that crazy guy that wants you to be his friend yeah. That's yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I did learn how to build that, but yeah, I didn't I didn't build it. You right. won't uh, you won't get the final ingredient till you're actually in the city. But um you also end up I mean, this isn't really spoilers. It's just something you do. You also get to build a, an actual reed boat like the one you saw by the fisherman. Um it's just that the the mechanics for using it are not great like the the places where it you know the way you drop it and steering is all just really not good in such a way that that that's like the only time I was really I really had the thought like god this game is annoying because it's pulling me out of my happy place and making me fight <laughs> really stupid controls and I don't wanna um and Stuff we could expand on. So I know that both you and Daniel said you'd like to expand on the painting mechanics. And for me, that's actually something I don't want to see. Because to me, this game, mm. uh, ostensibly it's about painting because you're a painter. But Kind of like we said, there there are no painting mechanics. You just kind of frame the shot and it magically appears. And I think if if your paintings turned into like a a mini game of having to like collect the right colors to make the right paintings, I think it would lose a lot of just that that charm of oh I see a beautiful thing. And I want to capture that. You know what I mean? Then it turns into the, right. having to have inspiration and easel, or not easels, but um, inspiration and canvases are already kind of a, a gentle gate just to say you can't make, you know, a billion paintings of everything. You have to actually be thoughtful. But. And they feed you enough that, like, you're you're not going to really run dry. And there are a couple, um, you know, infinite sources of both eventually. But I, I would never want to be in a place in that game where I look at, a, at something beautiful and go, oh, oh, I need to capture that right now. And then realize, oh, but I don't have violet pigment. 
I haven't done that quest yet. You know right. what I mean? But that's that's just me. I, right. I think there is a world in which there's a wonderful game that that could play on that. It just wouldn't be what I would want from this kind of game, personally speaking. The other thing I would like to have seen touched up is just the movement mechanics in general. Like I said, I haven't ridden in a boat, but just the walking around stuff is really dodgy and annoying. Like, for one thing, it feels slow. I wouldn't mind. I mean, I, that, that is absolutely realistic speed for a human being walking around on an island and even that you know your run speed is in fact a really brisk run but in video games you know they're a little more immediate and it's pretty normal to turn up the player speed just a little bit to where they're you know to where your run speed is actually just this sprint speed and it's okay to have the player running around at sprint speed but my, my problem with it is that it's not you run into a lot of invisible walls and you can't always tell where you're supposed to go like there's that giant tree in the middle of of the the island right just that huge huge tree and it really absolutely looks like you're supposed to be able to get under it there's like waterfall and then there's like a space behind the water coming out and the roots are parted right there but you walk up and it's just like this you realize oh this there's nothing under there and i'm sort of just running into an invisible wall and it i would have liked it if they were much more clear about where you can and can't walk like sometimes rocks you'll clip through them Sometimes you clip through tree roots. Sometimes they'll have bounding boxes that are much larger than the root and they'll act like a wall. Um, so trying to get around and grope around the invisible walls and figure out where you can and can't drop down, that would have been much, much nicer and made uh, exploration a lot less irritating for me. I 100% I agree with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is this is a game about making things that look beautiful, and it's definitely 100% um, form over function in any right. place where they could have made that choice. The one that bothered me is um, when you go to cross the river, and it's like, it's too deep, and it's like shin high, and I'm like, no, it is not too deep. <laughs> I, I would rather... I would rather... The, there would be a message it's like oh you don't want to get your paints wet or you don't want to you know get your shoes wet or so you know some story reason why i or the current is too swift you know but instead it tells me it's too deep when it is visibly not at all deep and that really rubbed me the wrong way especially <laughs> since it's really it's really expensive to cross that bridge and you know if somebody wanted to charge me 60 bucks to cross a bridge and i saw the the river itself was shin deep i i would definitely want to save myself sixty dollars by getting my shoes wet absolutely um i i will say that's one of the uh the more transparent mechanics of the game or or the yeah i guess that's the best way to put it is the is the gating that they do um right with things like the things like the bridge and um, you know, the fact that you can't be out at night because it gets too cold. Um, although you'll, of course, find solutions to that later on. Um, and you'll even get something that will help you move faster later on as well. Um, so you won't be stuck at a at run run speed all the time. But um, the the gating and the stuff that you can get to remove those gates is pretty pretty nakedly transparent in you know that just kind of gamey way where you're like okay they just want me to explore this area before i go to that one okay i get it right it's it's very artificial yeah yeah that thank you in one word what i just spent like three sentences saying it is very artificial um but if you like the game i mean it's definitely not a 
you know, experience destroying thing. It's one of those things where if you don't like the game, it's going to drive you crazy. But if you're willing to go with the game and you enjoy it, you'll just shrug your shoulders and do what they ask you to do. You'll jump through the hoop. Right. I'd agree with that. Yeah, it's not going to put me off the game. It's just all, you know, it would have been great if they could have polished up this, these little details. Exactly. But, yeah. But then again, it's an indie team and they accomplished so much. So I'm willing to cut them some slack, but that doesn't stop me from wishing it could have been a little bit better anyway. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, Soldier Hawk. I think we've done a show. I think we have. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. Uh, Paul's going to be ne back with me next week. So if you've got questions for us, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks so much for being here, Sol Soldier Hawk. Thank you for having me, Seamus. Always a pleasure. All right. And if you want to see more from Soldier Hawk, there will be a link to her YouTube channel in the show notes. You can watch her play through games. And then when she finishes one, she'll probably come back and tell us about it. Thanks for listening, everybody. See ya. Bye-bye.